participating at a higher level than richer people. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. Uh, but I think one of the, the, the factors is time. And thinking about this just from a practitioner's point of view, when you're trying to get that really broad scale, diverse kind of participation, it takes time to form those relationships to make people feel like there's actually a space for them in public life to overcome the various barriers people have. The more time you have to, to do that kind of work, the more successful you are. Uh, it's also true, I think, that the regular kind of structured opportunities for public participation give people more opportunities to shape the agenda, than and which is why partly they feel like the, 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 the setting is for them, than these temporary engagement efforts, which have been initiated by community leaders, even when those leaders are kind of non-traditional leaders. One more um, interesting w uh, reason to be thinking along these lines is that there is some evidence, at least, that this kind of engagement work can actually stimulate the local economy. Um, there's been a fair amount of research of this over the years. The most recent thing I think to look at is this uh, big um, study by the Knight Foundation called uh, Soul of the Community, uh, where in 26 cities they, they, they found that the higher the level of community attachment uh, to, the, to the city, the higher the level of economic growth and vitality. And they thought that actually it's a, a, a causative, that, that, that basically that, that attachment comes first, not prosperity of the community. So, which I think you know, a lot more research needs to be done, but a very interesting kind of argument for why this, some of this kind of stuff matters. Another one is, is kind of, I think, uh, the, the most um, uh, basic reason to be thinking about ways of sustaining participation is that people like it. <laughs> um, people don't usually expect to like it. They often, they get, take part in something like this, whether it's an online thing or a face-to-face -face thing, they take part because they think it's gonna allow them to make an impact on an issue they care about. They don't expect that they're actually going to be meeting cool new people, you know, or, or kind of forming relationships, or learning stuff they didn't know before, um, or being able to make an impact, do stuff themselves that, that kind of helps make an impact on the issue. Um, so they, they're often surprised by it. Um, but it's, it's a very tangible um, uh, feeling that people have. And I think uh, you can compare it, I think, to uh, John Adams in the Federalist Papers. He wrote about public happiness as a term. And I think that's part of what you see when people participate in some of this kind of stuff, when it's well-structured and they feel like it's going somewhere. Uh, it shows up on project evaluations as far as how people feel about the process. And, and for those of us who kind of organized or observed or participated in these things, it's probably the most obvious anecdotal outcome of the work. So anyway, so all this is kind of a different way of thinking about participation and, and democracy. And it challenges, I think, one of the most widely used documents in the field, which is, oops, the IEP2 spectrum. Uh, people, no, but does this look familiar to people? You, you find this thing, this is like 20 or 30 years old, it's developed by the International Association for Public Participation. You know, it's been a very useful thing. Um, and basically the, the way, the reason it was invented was to kind of, um, you know, allow public managers to kind of sort out how much power they're actually gonna give participants or citizens in a particular kind of setting, on a, on a particular public decision. So left end of the spectrum are the less powerful kinds of things. You know, you, you've made the decision already, you're just kind of informing people what it is, and the farther you go to the right, the more powerful they are. You know, they're either making recommendations or at the far right end of the spectrum, they're actually making the decision themselves. I think what we need to be thinking about and, and creating in our communities is a spectrum that, that looks more like this. Um, I know you can't read that, but this is um, uh, um, in this uh, guide from the National League of Cities called Planning for Stronger Local Democracy. It's a free download at nlc.org. Um, and, and basically what the spectrum is trying to be is a um, not kind of tied to a particular decision or issue, but basically a, a kind of a chart of different kinds of things that you want to have going on in your community all the time involving different but overlapping sets of people using different kinds of tools and face-to-face -face methods or online tools, all kinds of things. But that, that all of this kind of adds up to this kind of much more robust uh, system uh, for local, local democracy. I think, the, to me, the most critical part of, of, of any you know, such system um, are kind of spaces for citizens. You know, I, I love the quote that's attributed to Hannah Arendt that you know, democracy needs a place to sit down. Um, what she probably didn't foresee is that some of those spaces will be virtual. The, the place that you're sitting down may be in a meeting room with other people, but it may also be behind your, your computer. Um, but it, it's, uh, one thing that's kind of important to note about this is that we certainly do have kind of 
spaces for citizens that are kind of grassroots kinds of spaces like neighborhood associations, homeowners associations, uh, local school councils, uh, PTAs, by and large, even though I think they're intended in many ways to be this, by and large, they don't have these six characteristics. That when you look at the way they operate, they're really not all that inclusive. They're not usually very participatory. Uh, it's, even the most successful examples are things where you've got a relatively small set of volunteers doing great, you know, bless them, um, but they're not necessarily representative of their peers in the neighborhood or the school. They don't really necessarily know how to involve other people, and partly as a result of that, they tend to burn out, you know, pretty fast. Um, but I think it's important to note because partly our challenge may be not simply to kind of create new spaces for citizens, but to, to kind of take stock of what's already out there and figure out how do we take this and really renovate it and make it uh, support it uh, in various ways so that it actually kind of conforms to these, these kind of characteristics that we might actually want. So um, social media, I think, is a critical tool for that. Um, and I think the, 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 kind of the, the capacity that it has, that I mentioned before, this capacity to kind of maintain networks of people in, in convenient but powerful ways, that really corresponds to, to one of the basic drawbacks of face-to-face -face kinds of organizing, you know, where even with really terrific projects, you know, the momentum really kind of um, is lost fairly quickly. Once the decision is made, the plan is created, engagement also then, then ends. Uh, so online tools, social media in particular, kind of have the opportunity to, to kind of sustain more of that. And the ones that I think that are most interesting and most exciting are some of the simplest, uh, like um, these kind of neighborhood or local level online forums. Uh, there's a group called eDemocracy.org in Minneapolis that, that sets these up around the country. This one is uh, Burlington, Vermont, called the Front Porch Forum. But basically, there's just these, these little online forums, and, and part of what they're kind of capitalizing on is the fact that these people who are participating often all, also have already face-to-face -face relationships. You know, they, they see each other in the grocery store or the school, um, and they can easily get together. So it is right there, even when it's not intended to be, kind of a combination of the face-to-face -face and the online. And the other thing that's really cool and worth thinking about is that when you look at what people are saying in these little neighborhood online forums, it's not all political stuff. You know, some of it is the kind of, the, you know, what did the mayor say, or what is the school board doing about the school closure, or whatever. But there's also things on there about, you know, who has a good plumber that they can recommend, you know, <laughs> who, uh, who has a canoe I can borrow, <laughs> um, and, and who's going to the barbecue next week. And, and I think if you're thinking about how do you sustain participation, you've got to be thinking about those social and cultural reasons uh, that people are going to want to be participating in something, you know, in addition uh, to the face-to-face -face kinds of things. That, that, that yeah, uh, you know, people are going to kind of be um, involved in something because it helps them make an impact on an issue they care about, but they're also going to be involved or remain involved because they're going to see their friends there, uh, or their, their child care so they can bring their kids, or their kids are older and it's a way for their kids to kind of see their, you know, be part of a community of, of role models, or because, uh, you know, there's going to be food or music or caffeine or alcohol or you know all these different kinds of things um, and I think that if a hundred years ago we kind of dragged politics out of public life or community life that maybe what we're thinking about now is figuring out how do we kind of drag it back in. Uh, there's a great quote uh, a friend of mine uh, Gloria Rubio Cortez who's the president of the National Civic League says that sometimes you need a meeting that is also a party sometimes you need a party that is also a meeting <laughs> which I think is a nice uh, way of thinking about some of this kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, we've acted as if organizing democracy, organizing public participation requires a PA degree or expertise in facilitating dialogue and deliberation, or, you know, and all those things are certainly important and useful qualities. We might also add to that list, you know, the, the kind of skills and experience of a cruise director. <laughs> and that I think, you know, especially when it comes to sustaining participation, that's, that's important. So this, this guide that I waved around, um, it's intended to help people kind of combine those different sensibilities, uh, create your own kind of ongoing spectrum for public participation um, by kind of laying out uh, some potential building blocks for kind of stronger local democracy in your community. A couple of assumptions that we made when we were writing this guide. One is that um, strengthening local democracy is a whole community priority. It is not just the job of government or the community foundation or the library system, or the school system, or the colleges and universities, to do somehow make all the decisions and bear all the burdens, even if they could. I mean, what you want is all of those different kinds of groups, and in addition to that, various kinds of non-traditional leaders, 
community organizers, neighborhood leaders, all different kinds of people to be thinking about kind of how they want kind of the infrastructure for engagement to look in their community and then what they could all do to help support that kind of infrastructure. And then the second assumption we're making is that there's no cookie cutter here. Basically that, that, that every community is going to have its own answer to some of these questions and that it may be useful to kind of look at this kind of a list as kind of a set of potential ingredients, but knowing that you're the chef or you and your colleagues or your other residents there, you're the ones who are kind of coming up with your own unique kind of recipe for stronger democracy in your neighborhood or your community. So in the chart, um, you know, we, as you can see, we put these citizen spaces on the left where people would see them first. Um, we did that partly because uh, public officials and other decision makers, when you talk to them about participation or engagement, they tend to think first about kind of the, the decision-focused or issue-focused kinds of things. They don't think about citizen spaces first. So we wanted them to kind of catch their attention there. Um, in the middle are the kinds of things that, you know, about building skills, capacity, training people uh, to do some of these kinds of engagement and uh, deliberative kinds of things. And then the right is the stuff that's more about kind of um, official kind of public uh, problem solving and decision making. Um, and one of the things that this that's um, <laughs> that we put on here is, is, is kind of official public meetings, and and it amazes me that that even the, that we kind of continue to kind of um, to do public meetings in the same way we have done them before, even though people generally don't like the processes. Uh, and really, it takes just some fairly simple steps to make them much more reasonable and participatory and effective. So this all seems, I'm sure, like a lot of work. <laughs> uh, fun work, perhaps, because it's more fun being a cruise director than a city manager, uh, or at least adding those things together. But also because it's work that has to be done jointly. And of course, that work, kind of work may be more enjoyable, but it's also often harder and more time consuming. And since you know we started out here uh, with democracy as a question mark, as something we were kind of prepared to tolerate at best, you know, it, it may feel like you know, spending time and effort uh, to strengthen it kind of seems like a waste. But the thing is, even if we would want to, I think, I'm not sure we can really avoid this work that needs to be done, because so many of the kind of public problems we face really, to me, at their core, have a lack of strong democracy as the main reason why they exist. You know, failing schools, uh, friction between citizens and police, urban sprawl, uh, incivility and hyper-partisanship in politics, structural racism, uh, you know, conflicts of immigration, uh, unworkable local budgets, you know, all of these things are symptoms of the inability of public institutions to react to and capitalize on what citizens want and can do. The lack of cooperation and mutual support among potential problem solvers, the lack of consensus behind community values and plans, the lack of awareness and agreement on data, lack of social cohesion between different groups, they all corrode our ability to address all kinds of public problems. So I'm reminded of, of uh, when Clinton was running for president, you know, one of their kind of cheesy slogans was, it's the economy, stupid. And, and I wonder whether when people ask us why we care about democracy, we might respond similarly, it's the democracy, stupid. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>